Greetings and welcome to the next installment of the Kanonga Learning Series. Uh, and today um, we are going to start off by actually taking a look at if we can figure out the difference between these preverbal subject indexes. And I'm Tyler. <laughs> yes, I'm Peter. This is Tyler. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Morning. I'm very focused on the tax task already. Task already. <laughs> All right. So one of the things I want to look for is the um uh i'm gonna start by looking for za what do you think yeah yeah well now if you do it which, want, what you might want to do is space on either side because you have a whole bunches of za okay how many hits does that give us there I mean, it doesn't say but a bunch i think it no, it's, uh, there is a little place like at the bottom. It's just covered up by my, yeah, 71. Like 71. Hits. Yeah. So, um, well, uh, can you move your cursor over to show people who might be learning flex? Yeah, that little green thing there sorted by ref. Yeah. And then gives you the total number of hits there. 71 Zaz, and they mean something like third singular. Yeah. So, is it always right before a verb? I don't think that we would say that, but let's see. I think it's always right before a verb. But okay. first one, true. Verb throw. Okay, maybe. So we're, what we want to do is put a few examples into a document. What we could do is just document. note the... Um, what we could do is just note the text and sentence number for now. Preverb. So I think it would be a little bit tedious to watch uh, as typing this stuff. Yeah. Well, we got it. We got to take a look at them, or we won't know. So we're we, we yep. maybe you don't just copy and paste them all in, but we got to have some idea what we're doing. So if I were uh, showing the class how to do this. We'll do what we'll do. We'll copy and paste one or two, but for the most part, we're just going to leave the reference. Right. Like Tyler said, for ZA, I'm not going to leave 71 references. It's extremely common. So we're just going to pick a few really good examples and then just go from there. So if it, here's one where it's, mm, it's not right in front of the verb, but it, is, it does have a, well, some kind of, well, no, ZA, ZA, ZA. If you recall in the last episode, I was a little bit curious if ZA is sometimes used as a, um, uh, relative clause marker. So there may be other functions of za. Uh -huh. Again, if it's cognate with Roviana, sa, and asa, there's multiple functions. Can you do on. some? Can you full screen your flex, please? Uh, I want to resize a call. Okay, the that one, that mid, yeah. Can you move that over right? I want to resize that occurrence tab. If possible, can you keep going? Go to the right. Maybe it's not possible to do. Yeah, there. Can you resize the occurrences? Move that one. Make it narrower. Under concordance results. There. Yeah, just move it way. Yeah, yeah something like that. Then it's going to center the the target word. I think. Maybe not. <laughs> That's no improvement, unfortunately. Configure which call. Yeah. Well, win some, lose some. Maybe let's have it full screen for this searching thing, though, so we can. Yeah, there we. It has it has all the the target words centered there. I thought it would maybe readjust. Oh, we'd like to so, find some um, short ones, short sentences. So this is a pretty good one. Um, and this is eight point one in our doc here. Butu butu. Mbutu, mbutu. So we can go right there. We know it's in story two. It's in paragraph eight. That's right. That should be the first sentence in paragraph eight. Yep. So I'm going to put this as example one. We're going to call this 2.8.1. Since it's text two, sentence 8.1 in flex, what do you think of this convention? If it works for you, All right. I'm easy. All right, so there's our translation, or there's our transcription. Here's our translation. Now, 
when you want to go and make your real um when you want to make your real uh description so if i want to include this example in a description of the you know preverbal subject index markers in gananga i would need to put glosses in each one well, one of our options here is to copy this i'm going to full screen it so i can copy it easily from here and you can copy it from the glosses tab that's one way to do it. I'm using Control Shift V, by the way, to not import the formatting, but you get this kind of problem as well. So we're going to fix just one, just for the sake of demonstrating. Right? It's all shifted um, over. Yeah. I'm going to make this okay. its own thing. I actually, when I do them myself, I usually start with a tab like that. So I'm going to delete this word gloss line. I'm going to add another tab space there. there. I'm going to um, copy out belong to them, put this up here. So if it's too big, I need to move more to the second line, right? A little too big. So I'm going to actually take tan, Tandiria and I'm going to move it. Well, this was the long way, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't need Tyler judging my highlighting methods. So... <laughs> Oh, is belong. Yeah, that's that. Right. That uh, goes this here. This needs to be moved over a little bit. So now I'm going to have to organize things okay. where they go. So easy, you see how easy it would be to make a mistake if you yeah. were throwing a presentation or a, or a, some kind of paper together in a hurry. Real easy for things to get misaligned. It's super easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it gets pretty confusing for the reader as well. Because um, let's see how that's... Uh, V2 is misaligned. Well, because Pa was way over there. Yeah, that's right. Looking better. Ani, we don't know. Okay. What did, what did the dog say in the cowboy movie? Don't know. They shot my Pa. <laughs> <laughs> I know I messed it up, but the Pa reminded me of a Pa. I don't know. It's like, okay. Probably won't put that in the episode liner. Probably won't. You have to really watch the episode to get the extremely bad jokes. All right. So Ani has stars there because we just don't know what it is. Uh, what I would do next if this was me is I would use control I to make the language text italic. Right. And that stands out a little bit. I would continue modifying the free translation. Like this. I'll put it up here. So this would be how I would cite my example. I may move the 8.1 down here. Right. I might do something like this. That would be okay as well. Um, but this is basically how it looks. So as you can see, it just takes a couple minutes to fix them up. And then we still have to know what Ani is, which we don't. We probably want to know that if we were going to create a description. That said, if you're stuck on your description because you can't know every word, that's okay too. We can still yeah. figure out what Zah is doing here. Let's get a few more examples of Zah. Get closer to the... Yeah, what we want to know about Zah, as a reminder to the listener, is what does it mean here? Now, we're saying it's a third singular subject marker. Here we have it. At this time, there lived a woman, uh, Nango, at Nango, a woman. So, stay pa Nango, one woman. Za is probably third singular subject here. Um, who was married? She was married. Go Vitu. So in this case, it seems to be third singular. And what we want to contrast is between the third singular irrealis. So we should put a few more za examples, but then we're going to jump to what we think are the irrealis examples, right? And now, if it turns out that there is some irrealis realis split. Plain, mm. Realis means, according to the speaker, this really happened. Irrealis, it doesn't mean it didn't really happen. A better way to think about it is that either it didn't really happen or you're not certain that it really happened. So something like it could or would in English would all be irrealis. I could go, but I didn't. Or Let's collect some more. Okay. Let's look for another short. This one's pretty short. 
Now our our screen is such that it's pretty hard for us to see what's going on here. So I'm gonna... and that's right. And it doesn't have a verb directly after that instance. Yeah, so I think this is a different za personally. This and so I'm not, not gonna put it in our because what we really want to unentangle is the reality what aspect going back a little bit. Not every third singular subject is indexed before the verb. So well this one might be. It could be referring to the story. I I agree it could be a verb. Uh, my point is that not every verb has a pre-verbal subject index. Is that correct? It seems so to me. Yeah, some of them do. That'd be a neat thing to find out. When do you get it? Yes. When this, not, that's why. exactly what I'm trying to figure out today. So we, we're going to need some za, some irrealis, which we're pretty confident about, and then some with no markers. And we're going to compare so Let's look at the one you have there, nine, where it's highlighted. Look at the very next line, ten, one. There we have the verb kamua, 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 with no za with it. There, another time came. Let's have a zero marked one at the top. Actually, I'm going to make this whole thing. I'm going to call this zero, although later I would insult an insult, insert a null symbol. This is going to be our first example of one that has um, no pre-verbal pre subject indexing. I should use the hotkey. I'm just addicted to clicking and it's probably my uh, you know, old person trait or whatever. When it came to it. Oh, that's how I'm doing. Mule is again. Yeah. I guess it doesn't take that long to organize these, and it looks nice. Jeez. So I think I am going to keep doing this a little bit. Maybe not for every example, but at least for the first couple. Now. So people can see what it looks like. Yeah. One time. So. Yeah, I think I, I think I like the way this looks more or less. Came to it again. So if this were realis or irrealis, we would expect there to be something right before this verb. And remember, it's my hypothesis that realis, irrealis is conditioning this. Might not be the case. So I'm irrealis on that claim. Is that? No, I'm... Do you want to put a zero in your example itself? Show where we expect there would be something? You're going to make me find the null symbol, aren't you? Well, you use any symbol you like, as long as it's clear. But let's show people what it looks like. The empty set. I'm just going to copy this yep. right like that. And I'm going to control shift V so I don't get my. One, maybe someday we'll release our episode. We recorded a podcast episode on the topic of this kind of zero. Yeah. And that for link, literally, it's just a good way to keep track where you have a thing versus its absence. We can still very often say with great confidence where a thing should be, but it just isn't expressed. And it still is, is functioning. So it seems this language wants. There is a place in the verbal complex for this subject index, and it's worthwhile to mark where there isn't one. That would be a very important, a crucial thing if you were trying to describe and understand this language. I think in my it description, might. I would probably not put zeros, but I might if I was writing a prescriptive grammar. If I wanted to use this to teach heritage speakers that now, the heritage speakers, we just released a TikTok on this, actually. Heritage speakers range from completely fluent, speak it every single day, know every aspect of it, to it's something that they kind of know about but have had little exposure to. There's a huge range of heritage speakers. Or they've had them, exposure but little mastery, perhaps. For some of them, what they really want is to learn a version that's not as influenced by, say, maybe the major colonial or cultural language of their area. For example, and I'm doing my best to pronounce it correctly, Grant Mwututia, his dissertation at University of Hawaii on heritage speakers recovering ergativity in Samoan is a perfect example where Samoan is erg ergative, but a lot of the speakers speak English, heritage speakers speak English as a first language, and so English is not ergative, and it a little bit of the ergativity is lost in the transfer, unless you teach it as ergative. And so if I wanted to teach about this preverbal complex, I may make prescriptive materials, teaching materials, which contained zero right here so that people be like, oh, I should expect something. 
just so that they understand how slots in the syntax work. Now, if I was making this for a theory neutral reference grammar, so-called theory neutral, I would not put the zeros in. Let's get a few more examples of za. Um, yeah, and let's no. try to get some super unambiguous ones where we, where we know it's doing exactly what we want. I think this is probably a good one. And so it smelt good to the giant. Sounds good. Let me mention a thought about why we don't get za in that zero example, 10 one. Might be the time just doesn't belong to the same noun class as human beings and smells. Right, it's a, it'll be more clear when we have all the examples, but it's a great hypothesis that one of the reasons we aren't getting za there is not because it's realis or irrealis, but because you only get subject marking with say animate. However, I'm looking in my, on my machine, I'm looking at the very first sentence in the first story. Let me let you input that in piece and then I'll tell you. I, the, the first sentence was actually the example I thought of in my mind when I thought of one that had no marking. Exactly. It just, it, the meaning is there was a giant, mm -hmm. but there's no pre verbal index. It just has the verb first. So that it could also depend on what the verb is. Verb well, like. Case, um, so it smelled good to the giant. It is the food or whatever. It's not the giant. The za is not referencing the giant. It could be the smell. Or, or is smell a verb here? <laughs> By the way, this um, co oh. is almost certainly the prepositional use of co. Yes, I agree. So when we go yeah, back. Because it's, our... it's not introducing a clause. It's introducing just the noun phrase. That's right. To the... I'm going to call this dat. Or we could think of dat for dative. Yep. We could think of something else. Now, I think we should actually update our flex file while we're thinking about it. So I've got to move. Always this. good zoom menu out of the way. And I don't think we have an entry for it net yet. So we're actually gonna have to create a new entry. So no, no, you can sense. edit. Well, why? I think it's the same Lexeme. I think it's Humphone. I think it's a very, a very easy development to get from one to the other for the purpose that, that is dative, right? If you just had a noun like purpose that is gapped. Hmm, so. To me, they feel like so differentiations of a single thing. What Tyler and I are discussing are not that it means dative here and not that it means so in other places. It's actually a question of how language is organized in the mind. And this is where the decisions actually get pretty complex in flex and reflect a lot on the linguist's view of language. A lot of times people think like, for example, with universal grammar, well, I'm doing syntax. Why does that matter? I'm just trying to measure this binding effect. Why does it matter if it's, if you take things long enough and you do enough careful decision-making and analysis, you're going to get to the point where how is language stored in the mind that starts to become a central mm. issue to your analysis. So Tyler and I are revealing some of our fringe differences mm -hmm. here. Our difference on the fringes, that's what I mean to say. Not that our, both of our takes are pretty common, which is, I would say Tyler's a lumper here. He wants to say that there's one thing in the mind and it derives many things on the surface and I'm a splitter. And I say there's two different things. I would just say I'm really not trying to, well, I guess I am just, <laughs> never mind. Case, this I'm not saying yeah, all of it. Not disagreeing there. I want to, I want to group things. I want to have as few distinct items in my lexicon as possible to elegantly describe it, but we can create a new, let's go ahead and create a new entry here. But this point is worth fleshing out a bit. I think to me, let me offer a parallel to in English is a preposition, but it also introduces an infinitive. Of and off are distinct words. They come, they're cognates. They come from the same source, through and thorough. Now, in the cases where they're phonologically different, they, I think you have a better case that they belong as separate entries. I think a good, a really good example backed up by uh, experimental linguistics is B, the B verb and be the little insect that goes on flowers. So be that buzzes versus be that is. <laughs> and <laughs> in any case, uh, phagiacs, people who are losing language in linguistic research have shown that they retain one word, one sense of the, the you get this phoneme sequence, B, I, B. And the verb and the noun meaning the little insect versus the bee verb, they're not retained at the same rate. 
So Phasiacs lose one, but not the other. And if I recall correctly, they actually lose. I don't recall correctly. I just recall that they lose one. I, uh, I bet they lose the insect word first for the verb. That's my intuition because the be verb is so common. Um, but I don't recall. So that's Tyler. That's Tyler's claim. I, I don't recall. <laughs> I just remember that they lose them at a different rate, even though they're phonologically exactly the same sequence. So I think it's a good evidence that something that's exactly the same phonological spell out can be stored. I'm using air quotes because where's the mind? Where's the storage? I don't know. Can be stored as two different things. In this case, I actually do think Tyler's probably on the right path. Uh, so because it's exactly so often thing. used in order to as a sense. So... Uh, but nonetheless, for our discourse purposes, I still want to create a new entry. So I'm yeah. going to call this one that because what I want it is to really I want our analysis to really clearly separate prepositional phrases from like discourse uses, even though they might even be connected in the mind. So it's like a turtle within a turtle within a turtle or whatever. It's <laughs> it's very That's fun for me. It sounds intriguing. And we haven't added preposition yet. Yeah, we don't have very many. There's yeah, pa. pa. Yep, we just have like two or three, it seems, that we can clearly identify. So it's going to be under add position. Yeah. I'm going to click the plus sign next to add position, and I'm going to select preposition, which maybe we already have added one. And now we've got one called that. I think if we had added it, it would already be present in the list. Prep that. Yeah, I, th I think so too, but I didn't see it, so I don't know. Let's add a few more za examples. Uh, and we'll see if we can tease that. We're looking for short ones, particularly because uh, it's, it's easy to copy paste them. Also, easier to spot yes. what we're looking for in them. So that is is the way we want to do it. Now, I think you left one letter unitalicized in that example, the final letter in the sentence. Oh, uh, it's a different kind of E. That's why. <laughs> I'm joking. It was a total mistake. Deadpan. Just uh, because we've been dealing with these older transcription section systems where in what it's italicized to mean it's a different type of n except when everything else is italicized then it's unitalicized so very fun okay let's look for a good old za za okay. Okay, seems pretty good pretty good yep that's a real straightforward verb by missing a bunch of words in that one so let's get a different one i'm going to go back to gloss because i'm barely seeing anything here yeah that's right Oh, uh, you got a 12-3. That might be a short sentence. Uh, no, the last 12-3 that shows on the page in full. Three three down from there. From that example down. Well, they're all no, from the oh, same what? sentence. Right. That... But we don't know what Kuju is yet, do we? Uh, it looks like it would be cover. I think it's covered. What does Ohm do? Do we have tied yet? Let me see my notes here. I think we're about to add some words to the first story. Holy smokes. I don't have either of those, I think, but so looking right. more plausible now. Ondu and Kuju once each, right? Ondu, uh, Kunju is once. Right. Ondu could be the wave, or the flood, tide. Makes me Road. think Portuguese Covered, yeah. word for wave is onda. I yeah, know yeah. Related, but that's, that's right. my first thought. Yeah, no, I think it's tied. My um, bet is... Return. Maybe it's a bit. We're going to come back to that first text again. Let's find a, a nice okay. example here instead. See how easy it is to get sidetracked when you start down one path. Just you end up doing two or three other things. That's right. It's That's a continuous like, process. <laughs> it's a pretty short, easy one to know for sure. If there's a linguist who goes through this and is like, okay, first I'm just going to identify everything and then it's done and never goes back to it. And then it's like, now I'm going to describe the phonology and the syntax. And they never overlap time wise. I think it'd be a rare person indeed. Can we do 10.5 already? Let's have a look. Always fighting the battle on many fronts. 
They simultaneously and threw themselves into the net and carried it away. Oh, that was the very first one that we started. All killed all who were fishing for the dolphin with the net. What you thinking? Well, I don't think this. Ex I think this example will add more confusion. It's not a clear one. You know, what? idea. Let's let's get a negative example because there, with that k present, it seems really clear that it's in the in the verbal context, the com verbal complex. So, can you do a search for zake? It's definitely clearly in the verbal complex here. It's just not clear if it adds anything to the realis, irrealis debate. And this sentence is pretty puzzling because there we get lame come them. We don't get any gay lame, but gay vangararia. So, yep, what is I think it depends here? on, I think it's, a, my best guess now is that it's specified by the verb, whether it gets that marking or not. Gay or za comes, they're, the, they're I believe they're the same, marking the same aspect. Mm. Just one is singular and one is plural. All right, let's see if we can get just a super plain example. That's what we let's really a, want. Let's get a negative one though for to flesh out your your list. Let's just Zake. Yeah, here we go. Zake and only six five, only five there. Zake tiluzu otokehu. Because they were not lazy men, they fell to death. I'll call this Zake. I'm going to actually create a new column for Zake. Because this is basically just organizing examples. Yep. This is a, which is a big part of linguistic analysis. And in um, my opinion, the most fun part. Two, eight, one. Ah, one thing there. So you, you put 281 for text two, but that second example is from text one. So let's indicate that. I agree. Oh. And actually, just for all the examples, let's indicate what text it is. That's from the second, that's from the first. This is 1.1.5. 1. 1. this Zake Mbutubutu is the second text. 2.44. Bingo, very good. I can't see. Guru. Tinoni Gu as person. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That fusion of the Gu on there. We're gonna have to make a second line here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put yep. the whole Zake phrase on a second line. Sounds excellent. And that's he did not float. Roto. What are we thinking with thing, I wonder? Push Tiluzu over, tab that over. Oh yeah, we're gonna need to. No rush. Tab it up. Uh, and when you have a lot of space like this, I tend to tab it a little extra to make it easier to read. Yeah, I'm only not going to do it right now because I make it easier to copy into a new document. But if I were, if this were the written document that we wanted at the end, I would absolutely tab this out so it's easier to read, just less compact. Right, I get rid of free here, and mm -hmm. I said I was going to bold our thing we're looking for. Boom! Wait. So there it is, and I forgot to do it here, of course. Smelt good. So in that translation of smelt, the, the in the English that's clearly a verb. Smelt good. And I guess it must be. Now lea e. Is the e just part of that word or is that a suffix? Did we ever reach any agreement on that? Well, I we had my original thought mm -hmm. and I believe in the first episode or whatever, I was like so confident, but didn't want to tell you. Uh, and eventually, when we decided this must be a glottal stop or some other actual consonant, based on, I think, the word breadfruit, I have abandoned it. I see. We do so, get lea on its own. Is that the same word, though? Now, lea means good, or mm -hmm. please, I suppose, in Roviana. Uh, lea na hola, hola meaning exceed or pass, which we maybe have seen or not, is thank you. So good exceed could also be super good. Is That's beyond good. Yeah. Beyond good. Now, I understand that when I was in Hawaii, I saw like a Lea Lea bus or something. And I believe Lea has a good or pleasuring or something like that meaning in Hawaiian as well. So I wonder uh, about, of course, the history of this word. Uh -huh. um, what's interesting is uh, we only get this X consonant, whatever it is, because it's represented with a hyphen. In That's the, right. In the That's book. right. It makes it. In case you missed that episode, dear viewer, we. 
felt the need to replace the hyphen of the original because flex wasn't going to do what we wanted. Yeah. Uh, and I'm glad that Tyler insisted on using a capital X instead of my idea of, oh, we'll just represent it as a hyphen because I was wrong. It was not a suffix as far as we can tell so far. All right, and we're not going to get distracted, but we might go to Austronesian Comparative Dictionary and figure it out. I actually also have three of the five volumes of the Lexicon of Proto-Oceanic, and I've been reading through those. And uh, there might be even more in there than the ACD, so as far as Oceanic is concerned. Let's get another example or two of Zake. I allow it. And the result was not good. Right, that was when I was just viewing myself. It's nice and clear with that intransitive verb. Yeah. We want to see yeah. if transitivity plays a role. We want to know that too. So it could play a, a role, by the way. If you don't know what transitivity is, Please go check out our blog post. Yep. Kick bite. Transitivity to the language learner, I believe is what it's called. That seems, that's what I recall. Okay. Just a little bit too long for that. Line. Yeah, it's quite a bit too long, I think. I'm actually going to slice it up this way. Start putting these together with it. This would be to return. Return, yeah. Let's see. Oop. But it's, it's not please. You want to say it's not please? Oh, it's the verb please. Okay. It is not good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not well, so this is another problem is that we get lay'ai up, up here as we saw with the x but yes. we do also get it here by itself I think that, that it's going to be good I think it really is a transitivity difference lay'ai x is pleasing to y versus lay'a x is good yeah I, I have to agree with you on that and I, I don't know if we can fully flesh it out uh, we're not going to deal with it too much today because our point is the Zake, Za, Gay, Gadi, all this business, but Mina or whatever is the mana, whatever is the third singular one. We're going to try to figure all this out. One thing that we might find is that there's more than just two different aspectual distinctions. We're already entertaining three, which is unmarked realis mm. realis. Once we add in the negatives and stuff too, of course, it's going to get complicated. So let's clean up this example right quick. And then we'll... Good. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Did you leave that one? Looks good. Just a stickler for italicizing things where they should be. Do you see what fun it is formatting your examples? Uh, the only reason we really don't want this one is because we don't know what all the words are. We could just do part of that sentence where it is clear. Undu, yeah. We just have the first little clause there. The result was not good. What do you think? It'd save a lot of trouble in space. Uh, I mean, I'm already this close to having it all formatted. I'm just going to leave it. Okay. All right. But even though Flex is causing me these issues of I have to constantly be formatting, it's still actually much faster than adding in all of the glosses on your own. Here's this one, we get za and zake. Um, and I think, and then we get zake, leia, zake, zade. So we're getting a, a, a fair amount of both. I don't know what to do with it. I'd like to take a look at the Irialis ones and see if we can. Pretty sure Ondu has to be the tide. I feel very confident too. But do you want to add it into our flex file yet? Let us do. Yeah, I think Ondu is tied. And I think Konju or uh, Kuju is cover. Not all caps though. So I'm going to go in 
here and change his name. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It covered him, so he was killed, and he was killed. Yeah, sounds good to me, too. Let's add that. Kunju has to be cover. <laughs> nice column of words there. <laughs> this man. Okay. So once we've said that za is primarily a subject index, that does make it easier to spot the verbs when we see unknown stuff. Yeah. Za and ge. That's a good example for both za and zake. So I'm going to toss it up here with za as well. I'm just going to unbold okay. the zake and rebold the zas. Or not rebold because they weren't bolded before. Bold for the first time. To boldly bold where I've never bolded before. <laughs> he bolds goalie. In this one, it's so clear it's a subject marker because it's just oh. going through all this stuff. Okay. Now, before we go back to the text, I want to test that idea that whether you get a za or a zero is dependent on the verb itself. Can we do a search for lao for that verb? I mean, I can do one. And so another time came. Do we know which story and another time came from was? Which story? I'm going to have to figure uh, out. Easy enough to find, yep. Kamua. Only three. There it is. Yeah, Story two. So I know this one. So it's going to be two point. All right. What was the next search we needed to do? Let's do one for Lao with a space on either side. We have Lao in one case with a za right before it. I wonder if we get it. We do. <laughs> you want to see if we get Lao with. Uh... with without za. We had one with za there. Now, I'm really, really curious. What determines whether you get that index or not? Is it the identity of the verb? So what you want to know if you get Lao without an index. Yeah. So uh, there's one. I'm going to put this one into our zero right quick. Yeah. We um, do have a post-verbal subject. Noticing. Yeah, but we have one. Uh, did we copy it here? We might have to do it again later. But the... Um, one where we get pre-verbal subject index gay and post-verbal subject index Rhea. I believe the post-verbal one is actually the free pronoun. I think so too. What is conditional nice. whether you get it or not? I'm almost certain it is a spectral is distinction. Text two. Yep. Good. A spectral distinction. So there's some distinction in aspect. Okay. So with a zero. Another time came, so they went and cut down a sago palm. Versus. Okay, right. I'm going to add in our zero. That is the place we'd look for it. <laughs> it is nonsensical to say that a zero is here on some level. So the idea that it's simply past or future or whatever isn't helpful because another time is another time and so they went are not in the same tense. But if they're we're not, worried about whether they really happened or not. How are they not in the same tense? I guess you're right. Another time came is past tense. It's my understanding of English, but what do I know? Yeah. I guess I was also looking and thinking, since there's no marker, that this is probably really a present tense clause in Ganonga, and that it's understood to be past tense in the context. You've got to be got to be careful about over applying the categories of our language onto our target language well yeah basically that's why i was not trusting the translation 100 percent. i was thinking you know what like um if i you have to have like tense agreement oftentimes in english although that said if you get telling a story people often tell stories in the present tense even though you oh, know yeah. it's understood to be past very true it's a great way to tell a story all right so we get another lao let's look at a few more laos our point here was to see, here we have Lao with something else, me. That the woman of Nango saw, she thought, the man with the white carrying the shield reach Ninjom Bangara. I wonder if me is what and. Is and or what? Because me could be a pre-verbal subject index we don't understand, or it could be. I didn't, hear, I didn't hear what word you said. You think it might be what? The conjunction and. Uh-huh. So I'm going to leave this Lao for now. 
yeah. In fact, we had kind of thought that most of them were going to have Lao. Not all of them do. Here we're going to get a Muna. And that's telling, that's an imperative. You go to look for the biggest of them. So it's not something that's happened already. It is pre-verbal, so it's, a sort of, it's just a new kind. Muna. Yeah, so I want to look for the third singular. Mm -hmm. uh, is it Mana, I believe? Mana or Mina? Mana is I will. Mina. So we, our hope is this is third plural future. They might not all. Well, so we said. Let me really search true? for the glosses. Lex gloss. Or Lex entry. I think it might be Lex entry is better. And we're just going to search for everything that's third singular. Bam. And that doesn't have to be the whole thing. It just it has to contain those letters in the gloss. Broken it. it with no, no gloss contains it. Say what? No, no. Uh, if you go full screen there again. Oh, it just is. Your... Cool. All right. Well, I, I got it now. I'll go back. Here. Why is it bringing up Baba Katoni? Uh, okay. Just resize it a bit. There's, there's three. What do you call them? Okay. There so is a field. There is a field to the right of the search expression window, with three bubbles. Can you just broaden it so we can see what that is? That may be relevant here. Match case. Match. No. Oh, is that more than three? At end, at start, whole item. So anywhere, yeah, that is the field we want. Yeah. Does the so thing have three SG? In the lexical entry, when we search, it's not in any lexical entries, but Yet. it is probably in morphemes. Negative, <laughs> lexical mm -hmm. gloss. It's in it, uh, but I think not the way we want it to be. What? Um, oh, because the knee suffix has that meaning in it. Yeah, that's if right. If we go to analyze view, it'll become a little clearer. Well, let's see if we can figure out how to get what we're actually looking for. I... You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the lexicon. I'm going to look at the glosses. Uh, and just organize them in any way. It doesn't even matter, top or bottom. So this way, since it's backwards, and I'm going to go down and look for three. So we have third singular object. Can you make it just a little wider? Yeah, we got to make it go a little bit to the side. Thank you. Now, here's something interesting. We get third plural future, third plural irialis. Marimina, wow. Third plural subject, third plural. So we have the most diversity of third plural stuff. Yes. So that's probably where we should really start our investigation. Mm. It's also gonna be rarer than third singular. Well, maybe it seems to be we have more diversity. I mean, because this is what we've encountered so far. Mm -hmm. So looking at it, we've got Mina and Mari. And we can figure out the difference between Mina and Mari and Gay and Gadi. So Mina and Mari and Gay and Gadi. Then we had this me by itself one time too. Yes, we did. What a puzzle. What a puzzle. Unbelievable puzzle. I hate to say it. I think we need to enter more story. Let's go. Yep, yeah, I completely agree. We actually have two instances of me. How tantalizing. You know, do that. Okay, where that was with the Sago Palm falling, we had a me and then... But let's 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 do input more. Let's put more free translations and pin down some more. All right. So next time, yeah, we'll work a little more on. So we did zero zan zake, a couple examples. Uh, next time, what we want to do is work a little more on. Um, and we have a fair amount of first singular subjects. That we'll do we'll do the third plural next time, and each time we'll do a little bit to bolster up our examples. But we're getting to a point where. Um, we have some level of what's going on, but uh, still a little bit lost. So this puts us at, we finished at sentence one of the 14th paragraph of text two. Nope, I guess sentence two. So we're going to start with sentence three now. I have to go over to my text to find our free translations. This will be 15. 215 is what I'm looking for. I found it. All right, so... That's how it goes, the story of the Maluku tribe, the descendants of the Joliononi and Kendiononi. That's what we have to Good. And so, Zagwa, quite literally, that's how it. 
That's how okay. it. And so okay. when we're using gua for say, it's like the quoted of like, as we've talked about. Uh, so we also get it using it as a, what do you call like, simil similarative or something like this, simulative? <laughs> Simulative. Or similar. Kind of a word, yeah. Now here we have the alternate spelling of gay. You want to make the word gloss say, that's how it is, that is its how or something? Uh, he said it, how the story of tribe of Maluku, Natutindiria, the descendants. Do you want to add an alternate gloss? That's how it? Something. Because it's not about saying. Oh, Just yeah. that's how it is. I didn't click on the right word before we went over. Got to be careful. I wonder what D is. D-I. Yeah, but as a suffix. Gloss. That's how it. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that, if that's okay with you. Stretch. That's Push me the honor English as we go. That's how it how. <laughs> that's how it how. Do how like that, though. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody always asks how how and never why how. <laughs> Wait, no, I did that wrong. <laughs> Everybody always ask why how, not how how. Okay, well... Finally, someone has asked how, how. All right. Um, now we have this. Tuturu, tuturu ni. Uh, do we already have tutu in our it, cross there? Not tutu, but tuturu is to be mentally defective. All right. All right. I'm looking in the wrong place anyways. I, I, I had it by gloss, not by. So, all right. Let's take a look at our analyze tab. Now and the knee, why? Why knee? Crazy them. That singular object doesn't quite work to me. I don't think it's a verb. Should it be nge? In fact, is it an error? We've read, we've recognized it as an, an error. Yeah, as an as a variant. But I wonder about the text in this case. I I think it is. <laughs> You have I think it goes right any... in the right spot. It has a they. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes sense. They were the crazy ones of the of the Maluku. Do you have the booklet handy? I I do. Can you look on page twenty, the the fifth paragraph on that page? Zara Zavei. There's a it's couple a sentences Q, beginning. Q in the book. It's a Q in the original. Okay. Yeah, All right, updating that now. We got to fix the baseline. Find it in the baseline. Few things are as rewarding as when you spot an error in a language you are far from knowing. That's right. Although we had seen that this typographical yeah. error had already happened, and so we had. All right, turning back to tutudini. Tutudini. Fifty. Now this is where we need to have a little bit of an understanding of how the sentence is really working. So. The, I'm going to go back to gloss for you to make it easy for people to follow. They were the crazy ones of the Maluko. Now the translators, the well, let me go back Thank even you. another step and read. The translations attempt to keep the same rhythm as the original, but where the flow of the kumbukota is not comfortable in translation, normal English construction is used. Nice. Um, and English words might be closed in brackets to help the English speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I get the vibe that um, if there are any errors in the Kumukota and in my translation, which I would be pleased to hear about the original tapes and the Gizo. All right, so this version, skipping a few things, is meant for school children and others on Ranonga. So a lot of notes meant for English readers have been left out. Okay. If there are words in Kumukota you don't understand, ask your village, Baragozo. Which means old man. And I'll get with it. I'll get him on the phone right away. I believe that I don't have it. That's my guess at what it means. It could be elder or something like that. Yeah. Um. All right. So what I'm saying is the translators are giving us hints, but it's not their point to help us. Their point is to actually help people that are already living in the community. 
they quite literally mean heritage speakers, even if they're L1 speakers. They're talking about people in Ranonga, and this is part of their heritage. So what I'm saying is the translator did give us hints, but their purpose of translation was not to give us hints. It was a bit of an assumption you would understand Renonga. But because of their purpose, actually, in some ways, it's sometimes easier to understand what's going on in the Ganonga syntax. And they're giving us a hint here when they say, they were the crazy ones in the Muluku, comma, the crazy pair of people I've been passing on to you. Now, the pair of people, that I don't understand, of course. But if you look, Right after Muluku, it's kind of like it started a new thought. So if we look at this, that is how they were crazy, them, of Maluku. Mm. They were the crazy ones of the Maluku. And they say of the Maluku. And that's a pa right there. I'm guessing well, that is in But it's always riapa Muluku is the phrase, the, those from Maluku. Maybe it's a different structure here, but that... String of words is quite common in this. Text. I think the reason we're getting the ni mm -hmm. is because it's indexing the pamaluku, not the ria. Crazy ones of them. Yeah, the crazy ones of the maluku. They're crazy yeah. ones. So it's a possessive. Or, mark. What, or, do you, what do you? Mm -hmm. Or gay tuturuni is crazy plural crazy ones. Also possible. Yeah. I'm not going to bother to sweat it too much. I believe, though, that it's still like this. But should we call this crazy ones? Sure. Works. <laughs> That's so wild to have one as a plural. <laughs> I mean, we can do it in English, too. But when you think about it, obviously, people don't normally think about language this way. I mean, maybe. But there is the end ones. of the story. Zeros is plural, too. Ones and zeros. How maddening done there's no there's no translation here so i'm putting this in yeah, the bracket. yeah. done beto some of my roviana stories end with the same word beto so i recognized it the higa, I, uh, let's by the uh, way not stories i have told those are just stories that i have heard i don't want anybody to think obviously that i'm trying to claim that i own the roviana stories not at all i just meant the ones that i love okay Yigala. We, what will it be? Is it a verb? Pass on. Ara, zara. God, yeah, I have been passing on. I pass on. Them, I, I do them. <laughs> yeah, so this one really, um, the structure of this. Now, Koritinoni is pair. The crazy pair. Yeah. Of people. <laughs> Look at that word order, though. Not tuturu koru, kori tinoni. Looks awful the, BOS to you, doesn't it? Looks like adjective noun. Then, okay, we're crazy. Where tuturu is the verb. I Where, agree, what by the way. Not, not tuturu, no, I think tuturu is an adjective there. And that the order is adjective noun. And... I don't know why. Maybe it's just like attorneys general or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't uh, think so, but... Could be super emphatic. I think there's a pragmatic reason. And I, I was actually focusing on ga, gigalaria, ara. Ga is first singular subject. We know what the subject is. Yet the subject, ara, comes after ria. Yep. Now, we've seen ria as a subject and an object. I think that in this case, there's probably some sort of pragmatic word order. I wonder if you get the... So presumably this ga, by the way, is first person subject realis, presumably. According to my guesses, the one syllable ones are realis and the two syllable ones are something else. They are more marked if they're realis. That would, that would track. My guess. But we do get sentences without it. So it probably means something. When you have this subject marker, it's not as crucial that the free pronouns are in order. Right. Now, I'd like to take a small digression to tell you about a language called Malagasy. So I'm sure, I Tyler, you are pronounced Mal Malagash. Tyler even knows the name pronunciation better than me. But I know a thing about the syntax. Um, 
that may not be commonly known even to linguists. So here's a little story. What happened was back in the day, this guy Greenberg, who I think we talked about yesterday, Did mention him. Greenberg's greatest contribution to linguistics I know he's had some that people don't like, but something he did very well, I think, was his typological uh, universals. Now, it turned out a lot of the universals were broken, but they're true as a trend, which was neat and hadn't been focused on much before Greenberg. So Greenberg, like many, had identified there's six possible canonical word orders for subject, verb, and object. Right? Three of them make up the overwhelming majority of the languages of the world. The most common word order, based on number of languages, is subject, object, verb. The second most common word order is subject, verb, object, like English. So you get languages that are like Japanese, subject, object, verb, or maybe you'd want to say German is that way at some historic point. In any case, you also get subject, verb, objects, like Portuguese or English. You also get verb, subject, object languages, like Hawaiian, but these the combination of SOV and SVO accounts for probably 80% or more of the world's languages. It's the majority of them. Then mm -hmm. the third most common is this VSO, and that's like 10% of the world languages. And then the last three word orders are VOS, mm -hmm. um, uh, OVS, and OSV. Are, are, I'll make up only a tiny, the, the last two, maybe you're only like share two or 3% of the total world's total. It's very rare. Well, back in the day, they hadn't really observed um, verb object subject languages i believe that if i'm I, I could be wrong i'm not that into constructed languages but i believe that klingon is verb object subject and it was a joke not a joke like a cool neat thing because languages didn't exist that way right they, because, because it's, it's not a human language they made it uh, awkward made it decidedly non-human one of the neat things in the history of linguistics is that malagasy has been typically used as an example of a verb object subject language, which is a counterpoint to the claim that verb object subject languages can't exist. Now I'm here to hit you with the third layer of conspiracy or whatever. Malagasy is not a verb object subject language. How would you say that? How can I say that? Well, I can say anything that I want with my language, right? But why? what substantiates my claim? Malagasy is better considered as a symmetrical voice language that doesn't arrange word order based on subject and object it ranges word order based on pivot and non-pivot and either subject or object could be pivot i believe it would be called a pivot final language then so you get verb non-pivot pivot right and when subject is the pivot that's fine and when subject's not the pivot then it looks like the other word order right so pivot is a salient thing in the language it's so salient people conflated it with subject and of course there are linguists this is a debate among syntacticians today there are many syntacticians today that still feel that what i am calling pivot is what should be called subject and this is more of a labeling difference mm. although i feel very strongly about it and not just me there's it's a a lot of syntacticians are on my on my same side here my point is when i start seeing this switch between vos and vso I start reaching for my wallet immediately, right? Now, I will tell you a story the Jedi would never tell you about Roviana, right? So in my own dissertation, I claim that Roviana has this complex syntactic ergativity, right? And I think that's true no matter what analysis you take. However, the analysis that I didn't put forth in my dissertation that I think might be syntactically more accurate is that Roviana has an extremely unique symmetrical voice system, and the symmetrical voice system has an ergative alignment, which symmetrical voice systems like Tagalog are inherently nominative accusative. Right now, people, there is an ergative analysis of Tagalog, but it just discounts the symmetrical voice system. It's like talking about the subject word order of Malagasy. It doesn't make sense anymore. So to say, Tagalog is ergative is you have to discount a whole bunch of pieces of the voice. And when the transitive subject is non-pivot, it's marked different. You see how they could get this ergative analysis out of it. If you don't know about it, send me an email, send anything. We'll write a blog post about it if you're confused. I figure if you're this deep into the Ganonga series, you're probably curious enough to Google it or ask or whatever. In any case, now that we're seeing these shifting word orders, we have yet another question asked. Now, we wouldn't be able to know if it's symmetrical voice really without uh, talking to a speaker. But we could have a solid hypothesis and disprove it pretty quickly. And what you really want to do 
is disprove things. It's hard. You can confirm something a lot of times and not be totally confirmed. All right, so do you think Gigala means passing on? Sorry for the aggression. <laughs> you get me started on symmetrical voice, and I'm gone, buddy. Gigala, we get three times. They followed the rights of the V2 people, but for everything, there was no answer from Tangi Tangi until they said... It's going to be... Hmm. They followed the rights. So he actually doesn't say, I've been telling you the story. He says, passing on to you. Hmm. So pass and follow are two glosses so far. Okay. So the tribe itself cannot cause to pass. Cannot va gigala. I think that gigala might be pass. What do you think? Pass. Sorry. I'm distracted there. So we have, for for Gigolo, we get it meaning pass and follow. Interesting. And not, cannot tell. Va Gigolo, they cannot cause pass. They cannot tell us themselves. Uh, okay. Here we get, they were the crazy ones, the crazy people that have been passing on to you. We look at our other example. Ge Gigolo Betua. They followed the rights of the V2 people. Follow them. They passed finish. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, the, so what is the common thing between pass and follow? It might be we don't have a word like this in English. Can't tell us. And if you thought about... If you thought about... So we have pass has multiple meanings in English. I can pass you on the highway. That's not the pass I'm talking about. But you can see why that kind of pass would also be associated with something like pass me to salt. And that's a ditransitive. Mm -hmm. right. So you go from transitive to ditransitive meanings. You cannot pass something intransitively, I don't think. No, uh, time passes. You cannot pass it intransitively. Well, it's inherently transitive if you say you and it. Yeah, pa it... Time passes is syntactically intransitive. I do agree with you. But it's it means semantically involves two entities. Does it? What can time pass if it doesn't pass something? Well, <laughs> before there were time experiencers, was there even time? If time passes without anybody to experience it, you know, in a forest? Would it still make a sound? Yeah. So. So I don't know uh, what to do with Gigala. Here for the man, it's about we just say pass on is one of the senses of the word. Pass on, follow. Yeah, well, I think all right. So, pass on is really good because there you get follow could be pass on, they passed on the tradition. Something like that. I think you're right when you say we might not have a word like this. It's hard for me to unite all these senses, especially at this hour. I'm going to call it pass on, and we're going to have to update the yep. pass dot on, and we're going to update the definition to say. Oh. Pass on, follow, tell, likely no mm -hmm. one to one English equivalent. So now we have a note for ourselves on how that's going to work. All right, and we've done a pretty good job, but as we saw this morning, we tried to deal with pronouns. We have a lot left to learn. We sure do. Can you get rid of those empty paragraphs at the bottom? That's really good. My baseline. All right. Just backspace. Now we got a. We've only got another quarter hour. I'd say let's go back. Before, I'm going to get the next text ready. Before we do that, let's revisit our first. The what? what hmm? Well, let's read the, I couldn't hear your word. Let's revisit the first text. Avocado, the crab story, the giant and the crab. And I'm gonna go get ready. Text three for input to use the stream. I think it might be kind of cool to just read text three so we know the story. Well, remember what we said, what if we, 
put it in and then try to translate it without just having the English ready to make ourselves an extra challenge. Does that sound good? We can try a little bit, but I think it doesn't sound good. <laughs> All right. Maybe text four then. I think it sounds very frustrating when we don't know the God Gaudi business. We, we might get close on our translations. We can try a couple right at the beginning. All right. So I won't. Or a treat. Let's not do right at the beginning. We'll, we'll, we'll try a couple. We'll try it variously for the rest of the series. We'll try a couple here and there. We should have tried it today too. Yeah. Let's go back to story one and visit it. We got a couple minutes left. We'll look at our Vavakato story. Vavakato, mm. which means story. Nana. <laughs> and we're going to see story. we're figuring this out. We've got a cool example of zero right there. So since I have this up, I'm just going to go ahead and toss this one in there. And to keep things quick, this is something uh -oh. you shouldn't do, but you could do. All I'm going to do is update the number and I'm going to leave the rest for a future time when I have time to mess with uh, formatting. All right. Beto Colandia. This one again is a zero. And there were three youths. But again, we have different speakers. Do we get Ka figured out yet? Oh, it's a numeral prefix is what that is. A hundred percent. I'm putting <laughs> num. Num. <laughs> N-U-M. Makes, yeah. I don't think it's we could comfortably call it num. <laughs> Uh, today, it could say I have become comfortably numb. So, um, Gaili Gendi, one day the three brothers went out to look for crabs. We don't know Gaili or Iru. That could be an error. Could it be it could be Nge and Li. Could be some other thing. Well, Gaili spelled the same way in the next sentence. Mm. I guess I'm getting betting that Gaili Iru goes together and Gendi is in between it because there you get Gaili Iru again out Gaili so Gaili Kenny no they say went out after they bent out so they went out so Kenny Gaili Iru some combination of this is probably went out looking for food um, and Gendi there is food and it's crabs how do we know it's crabs? <laughs> true. Very true. There's still a lot in the first story we don't know. Jeez. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't have a good guess on Geli or Iru per se, but I think Geli and Iru together are something. Defo something. Means go out. But my problem is I'm extremely influenced by Portuguese in this moment. I R and I just oh, yeah. I want to say it means go, obviously. It doesn't necessarily, although we have seen some you may not think about it, but Lao go. So in Roviana that's La. And La is kind of like the distal determiner or whatever in Portuguese. La over there. Okay, true. So, I had not thought about that. Well, if you thought about Rovian in Portuguese every day like me, you would. <laughs> Get it together, Tyler. <laughs> My first mistake there. <laughs> I'm... Tyler, you completed the entire Duolingo course on Portuguese, right? At one stage. They've since extended it. But yeah, I had reached a goal. <laughs> it was like a, a matter of days, too. But they just re reordered it. And so now there's more material. So I cannot claim to be complete there i wonder if this xi is a anti-passive anti-passive you want to tell the good girls and boys what an anti-passive is well if that's <laughs> yeah let's think about it this way so you get a passive sentence a good example is i'll do a active sentence then a passive one an active sentence might be um I'll use Tyler's name. Tyler baked the cake. Now, if we want to make this passive, it would be the cake was baked. Was spoken. By Tyler. And this mm. by Tyler is optional. right? So what was formerly an object is now a subject. Thematically, the cake is a patient, regardless of its syntactic role. Right. 
So here we have it smelt good to the giant. If we have this as pleasing, it would be the food or the smell pleases the giant. Exactly, yeah. So the smell would probably be the subject whether the sentence was transitive or intransitive. Would you agree? And the last part again, sorry. The... So we have, so the, the smell pleases the giant and the smell was pleasing to the giant. Mm -hmm. The smell is the subject in either yes. circumstance. Okay. So what happens is in a passive, what was formerly an object is now syntactically a subject if you view the passive as a transformation. Okay. In an anti-passive, what was formerly the subject is still the subject, but for whatever reason, the syntactic object is no longer syntactically an object. This wow. is common in ergative languages, somewhat common. You know what? I'm going to skip this. There's a big line of reasoning in syntax that anti-passives are motivated by ergativity so that the ergative argument can be promoted to intransitive subject and therefore have access to things that only intransitive subjects and objects called the absolutive have access to. But Polinsky has done some uh, typological work that shows there's not really any statistical correlation between anti-passive and ergativity. Wow. It's something that you expect. It's not something that fleshes out. So mm. uh, that would be my real answer there. And that's why this is not good evidence that this is an ergative language. What we need to show that it's ergative is we really need to see something different happening with transitive subjects. Right? So like, say, for example, um, that we were only ever getting za agreement when it was transitive. We only ever got it when it was transitive. That'd be pretty good evidence. It's an ergative marker. Right. So. I should have maybe said this earlier. Ergativity is when the transitive subject is treated different than transitive, intransitive subject, and the. Good to know. <clears throat> so, I don't think that Vanonga is ergative, but we, we actually just don't know enough yet to know. Uh, and there's some differences that aren't obvious to us, and we know more about the syntax, it might pop out at us. Another possibility, like I'm saying, is it might be symmetrical voice, and that might be why it's very confusing for us. Because to know about symmetrical voice, you need to know about relative clause formation and WH question formation, particularly if they leave. So a relative clause with a gap, we would see something like only the pivot can re leave a relative clause with a gap or something like that. I mean, you might not. In a language like Tagalog, what is syntactically the subject can be extracted from any voice, but non-subjects can only be extracted from their voice. So it gets confusing. Um, and I love it. That's my favorite thing in the world. And I wish it was valuable to a major tech company and they'd hire me to figure out the difference between what I would do with my dream job. Second choice after Ganonga series with Tyler. This is my dream job. But second choice uh, would be to go out and distinguish between ergativity and symmetrical voice. I love it. I think it's so interesting. Um, and feel free to steal any topics you hear in there for your PhD program project if you're a PhD student. Take them, email me. I'll help improve your abstract. I'd love to. You don't have to put my name as second author. Nothing. Don't even give me credit. In fact, if you meet people in real life, tell them, I really don't like that guy, Peter. I just like symmetrical voice. That's okay. But please keep studying the little described languages, uh, particularly the ergative and symmetrical voice ones, or if you are really hardcore, the ergative symmetrical voice ones. Okay, I don't know Veala either, or Pange, or Nadi. This is my kind of food today. This food. Nadi is going to be na and adi or something. Yeah. We don't really know. So nadi might just be like the plural article. Yeah. That's, yeah. Na that seems to be plural. Plural common article or whatever. But I actually don't feel confident enough because it is weird for it to be sentence final. Like we said, there's many dialects of English, but there's not a dialect of English where it's grammatical to say, I like dog the. No. Dog, not yet. The there's, there are closely related languages to ours that do put the article last. You mean corrupted languages? <laughs> Dear listener, this is a joke. I, oh. If you're hardcore into description, you joke about being prescriptive. No language gets corrupted or broken or anything like that. That's simply not true. This should be follow it. Let me make sure in our analyze tab we have it right. We do. Follow it. So. Sorry, caption. And this one has a, an actual subject drop. 
Huh. Well, hmm, we don't need to gloss hmm. I'm going to leave that. Gengu ni? Oh, we probably just don't have a word gloss. Gengu. We don't have gengu in there. We know it's one singular dot possessive dot food. So, because remember, there's a switcheroo there. Yes. Gendi is their food, and gengu mm -hmm. should be yengu. I say should be. Now I'm sounding prescriptive. I just mean that if it was retained historically, that's probably what it would be, because D is transparently the third plural possessive uh, direct possession, and gu is first person singular direct possessive, and the ye is a, and that's why I wondered here actually too, ye is a edible classifier. Ah, and it is in Roviana, and it's not that uncommon uh, otherwise. Mm -hmm. We actually have this one not analyzed. Oh, I need to go back. That's what I was looking for. Need to look at what we called. Um, Gendi. Edible. Oh, we broke it down. So I'm going to have to call it a edible dot one singular or whatever so that it groups together. Could have done this a smarter way so it'd be easier to get back where I was going. I'm going to have to now because I'm lost. Learn. I'm going to call it edible dot one singular. Not much else to do about it. We could put dot pause too if you want to, but I think edible one singular doesn't mean I'm edible. I think it's pretty clear. Uh, did you say dot pause? Dot P O S S possessive. Oh, possessive. Okay. Possessive. Got it. Why was the cowboy dog so jealous? I don't know. He was possessive. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> I made it worse. Yeah, I definitely did. <laughs> I joke earlier. I, I don't know what my problem is. I think it's very funny. Uh, if you can laugh at yourself, you know, you. it's a thing. It's all right. All right. <laughs> Small compensation for having real compensation, but it's not the worst. We actually have most of these words except for the cut. Now, Vevena, we know is origin, right? Or reason. Or how or something. Where did you find it? Origin. You take it. Yeah, yeah. So what was the first line at Pi? Where origin? It really could be more basic. Just meaning like place. There's other words for place too. Yeah, and we see Vevena also used for reason and origin. Yeah. Other so I just think origin is a good one here. Now, we don't have Kenendi. What we're missing is the word glosses. I believe we have Kenny in there. Kenny. They killed Kenny. Try dragged it out. Pause to drag out. In this way, the giant dragged it out and ate it. Give me the body. So this is Nana, I believe. Check that out. Uh, no, okay. Uh, this way, like, this is kind of like, like that giant. That giant. Wow. So he went and uh, went something and caused out. Oh, he outed it. Okay. Oh, can he, that's interesting. It's not a serial verb because each of those two verbs, kenindi gania, has object or just has the suffix of its own. Very good. You have the va causative. Excellent. So ragat is going to be a root for drag, you think? Some part of, some component of the dragging action? No, I think cause out is drag out. Do we have in this way? Is that ragata? I think the so beto. I don't know what ragata is, and it's not going to be easy to tell from this. A gap there. But I think Vak in Indy is cause out it. And then <laughs> you've already nailed it though. We can now just how do we know it's not a serial verb? It's actually a sequence of verbs, not a serial verb. Because you get this agreement here and that agreement there. It wouldn't get double agreement. And I don't think the Kenindi, that's clearly not um 
it's not the typical object agreement. Um, I think that it might be a nominalization of Vakini. I think Ragatha might be the another word for the crab's body or the meat uh, okay. of the body like that. Or like that. Mm -hmm. And that that's the thing that was Vakinindi the and went bodies out causing it and <laughs> ate something like that. Delightful. Love it. Well, we're gonna have to leave this mystery for next time because we're running out of time today. Uh, but we'll upload this soon. By the time you're seeing this, we'll probably have uploaded all the episodes before. We'll probably have recorded a bunch of new episodes, but go ahead and contact us on Twitter or email or uh, any social media that we have and reach out to us with your uh, observations about Ganonga or questions about syntax, ergativity, anything. All right. Ciao. Always a pleasure. <laughs>